This is uh, a Celebrating Our Wildlife Heritage interview of Kathy Frost and Lloyd Lowry. Uh, today is October 9th, 2017. So you can start off, we're gonna ask you about um, when you guys were born. <laughs> Oh, when we were born. <laughs> a really long time ago. December 16th, 1949. January 16th, 1950. Oh. And where were you guys born? Topeka, Kansas. New Bedford, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, and is that where you guys grew up uh, individually? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I spent 20 years in the southeast Massachusetts area, New Bedford primarily, yeah. Mm -hmm. And no, I was an oil brat. My dad was okay. a geologist for Shell Oil, and I moved every three years my whole life. Oh, I've wow. lived in Alaska longer than any place else yeah. by five times. Oh, wow. <laughs> and like, what did, what did your parents do? Uh, my father was a draftsman and an engineer, and my mother was a secretary. Okay. And your mother? Homemaker. Um, and then, what got you interested in biology? Were you interested as children, or did that come later? Oh boy. <laughs> I, oh, I, mean, I followed my dad around the mountains as a kid. As mm -hmm. a, he was a hunter and a fisherman. And I went to the ocean in the summer to see my granddad, and I liked the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I guess when I was young, I thought I was going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. And majored in biology with a minor in English. And when it came time to go to graduate school, I really didn't know what I wanted to go to graduate school in. Mm -hmm. And I can remember going to the head of the department at UC Santa Cruz, and well, I went to his secretary and said that I wanted to go to grad school there. Mm -hmm. And it was after admissions had closed and I just moved there. And she said, well, admissions are closed. And I said, well, I'm going to school here. <laughs> and people, what do you want to study? Mm. I don't care. <laughs> Biology. I want to go to grad school. <laughs> and I finally got an interview with the head of the department who was a very prim and proper British man who asked me if I would consider botany and open mouth, insert foot, I said I couldn't think of anything more boring. And he said, well, then he won't be my graduate student. And he had hired a new professor that he'd never met and never seen, who was a marine biology professor. And she, he said, if you can convince him to take you, I'll let you in. Oh, wow. So that's how I became a marine biologist. <laughs> Total serendipity. And then what was your interest, Lloyd? Well, living in uh, southeastern Massachusetts around Buzzards Bay, my dad always had a boat, and so some of my earliest memories are going out in the boat with him. He'd uh, pull a little trawl to catch scallops or something like that, and I can just remember all of the animals and all. So we spent a lot of time around the water, and it was in a rural area where you could go fishing in the cow ponds and, you know, hunting and whatever. So I just had an interest in animals. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, after I got out of high school, there was uh, sort of a new university being formed, Southeastern Massachusetts University, mm -hmm. and um, they had hired a number of young marine biology faculty there. And mm -hmm. so I signed up for the biology program with a marine option and ended up with a degree from them. Mm -hmm. And so were you both at, um, at UC Santa Cruz at the same time? That's right at where we met. Where you met? Were you there? Did you start at the same time, or was Lloyd already going to school? You well, went to summer session before me, right? No, uh, Kathy and I both went to summer school at Hopkins Marine Station, oh. uh, Stanford Marine Station in, in uh, Pacific Grove, and we didn't meet at that time. Mm -hmm. um, this was 1971 and uh, I was going to get drafted and went into the Coast Guard Reserves instead. Mm -hmm. And so I had to go back to Massachusetts and do boot camp and things like that. Mm -hmm. But um, the professor that I'd taken the summer course at Hopkins with was a uh, Santa Cruz professor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to him over the period of time and he said, yeah, when you get done, come back here and we'll, we'll take you as a student. Mm -hmm. So then we met there as students in 72, I guess. <laughs> and then Alaska was just a lark. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really was 
when you're a student, you want to know how am I going to plan my life? How yeah. am I going to? How do I figure out what I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if it's reassuring or not, but it really was. It, it was one of these dear sir mm -hmm. letters that Lloyd wrote. And I mean, in retrospect, you don't necessarily expect anybody to answer those letters, but mm -hmm. Burns did, and we <laughs> ended up here. And and at the time, Lloyd and I were living together, and John asked Lloyd to come to the job and Lloyd sort of explained that he had a partner and John obviously never really tuned it in and two of us showed up here and <laughs> it was October and it was one of the coldest, it was 1975, it was one of the coldest winters on record mm -hmm. and it was 40 below by Halloween and so we were living in a tent trailer <laughs> and I couldn't stay in that tent trailer in the day so mm -hmm. I started volunteering at Fish and Game and you know, John never said anything about working for him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I went up to the university and I got a job up here and when to tell Burns that I was going to start work at the university and he sort of looked at me and he said, well, what are you going to do that for? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, they're going to pay me. Mm -hmm. And so he hired me. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> what was the job at the university that you would have got? It was that? working at the museum sorting mm -hmm. invertebrates. Oh. <laughs> sorting and identifying invertebrates, which was an extension of what we were doing with our seal stomach uh -huh. stuff. And mm -hmm. we'd met the people up here because we were working on seal stomachs and mm -hmm. trying to figure out you know, the identification of what was inside of them. Yeah. And so it was a guy named George Bueller. And, and I don't know, Nora Foster, I think, is long gone up. There was a, a woman named Nora Foster that was mm -hmm. did shellfish identification at the museum. Mm -hmm. Pretty funny. I went to the NPR meet, the meeting last spring, and her daughter was there. Mm -hmm. and came up and introduced herself. So mm -hmm. Become a full, mm -hmm. full generation. So then, instead with going with the fish and game job, was that then introducing you to field work? That would not have. That would have been a straight musician mu museum job. And so I was really happy that John, the the fish and game job, the, the came through. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Was that your first experience ever doing field work? Yes. Well, field work, the way you do it here in Alaska, I mean, the yeah. book would go to the intertidal and, you know, sample invertebrates, and yeah. uh, a lot of my work was diving in the kelp forest, and we'd go and dive and, you know, lay out transects and Underwater. count things and mm -hmm. collect things and identify things. So, uh, I mean, that was field work, California style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to fly out. somewhere or take a big boat or anything. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I think both of us, I, I'd grown up camping and hunting and fishing and hiking mm -hmm. in the mountains mm -hmm. and so I, I was an outdoor person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then you show up here in Fairbanks and go to the field and I mean outfit a Boston whaler to go out and, mm -hmm. and collect seals. That was something that back in those days that's how you found out about reproduction and diet is, is you, we use seals caught by native hunters when it was in a coastal village but mm -hmm. when we went offshore in the ice like working off the NOAA ships we were doing our own hunting and we were killing animals and then doing necropsies and mm -hmm. collecting tissue samples and all that biology and I mean I'd never shot a rifle until mm -hmm. I had this job and <laughs> Burns sort of said well if you can't shoot you can't go in the field and I said well then I guess I'll learn how to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> It was a steep learning curve. Oh yeah, yeah. Neither of us had any Alaska experience. hadn't been here. Didn't really know that much about it. Uh, mm -hmm. When we packed up to leave, we had bicycles and we sold our bicycles. You couldn't imagine you'd use a bicycle in Alaska. Mm -hmm. We got here and they had better bike trails than they did in Santa Cruz. <laughs> we bought a whole case of wine because we didn't know if we could buy wine up here, and we got up here and it it got forty below and all our wine froze. <laughs> I mean, it was, we were really naive, yeah, we were just green. completely green. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, thankfully, working at Fish and Game, the people were really good. Yeah. You know, there was so much knowledge and so much expertise there, and they were 100% willing to share it. You just yeah. had to be willing to listen and learn and ask mm -hmm. questions. And, and if it hadn't been for the, the tutorial that we got day after day after day, mm -hmm. you know, we never would have learned how to to stay alive here and how to learn things about the animals. Yeah. And having, you know, John basically assign us to his Eskimo partner in Nome. I mean, Ed taught us everything we knew yeah. about the ice and 
walking and ice, staying alive in ice. Mm -hmm. it, it was it was huge. Who are some of the most influential people at Fish and Game for you early in your career? Well, uh, John Burns, of course. And Buffet here at Buffet the university. At the university. They were the, mm -hmm. the mentors of, of all the young marine mammal biologists. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dick Bishop was was very helpful to us, Bob Stevenson, all these other people. If you, Of course, if you had a question about moose, you went to the moose biologist. Mm -hmm. and these were the experts, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they, they were the best there were. And, uh, Terry Bendock. Terry was a sport fish biologist, but he worked mm -hmm. on the North Slope. Mm -hmm. So we spent quite a bit of time with Terry, and Terry come, we'd actually run into Terry out in the field. Mm -hmm. And then one of the very valuable things about working for Fish and Game is they had uh, regional offices all around the state. Yeah. So if we wanted to go to Nome and do something, well, the Nome area biologist would have a boat, you'd have a truck, you'd have maybe an airplane if you needed it, and uh, then you got the, the local information, you know, uh, where the seals hang out. They all live down at Woolly Lagoon, you know. Here, here's the keys to the boat, you can go to Woolly Lagoon. Mm -hmm. uh, and without that kind of ability, you just pull into a town and you know how do you get anywhere how do you do yeah, anything yeah. you know so so the state was very well positioned to do this kind of work and you know, that we took advantage of that yeah. and there was a guy named Bob Nelson who was the Noel Mary biologist and Bob was our field partner for a long time and he's actually responsible for us moving to Kona and we still go fishing mm -hmm. with him a couple times mm -hmm. a month mm -hmm. but he was the, the gnome AB and mm -hmm. we'd show up in town and he had a whaler and had a floor to crash on and mm -hmm. a place to eat dinner and we spent many, 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 many hours trying to get ourselves killed in the ice with Bob. <laughs> no, we're trying not to get ourselves killed. <laughs> it just looked the other way. <laughs> what sort of uh, hobbies did you pick up when you moved to Alaska? Did you start hunting and fishing right away, or were you taking time? Well, the most thing we did most passionately was race sled dogs. And Dick Bishop gets half the blame for that. He doesn't get all the blame, but he gets half. Our first sled dog was a puppy from Dick and from, Mary Bishop. From Dick and Mary Bishop. Uh, but yeah, we did that from uh, 1981 through 2000. We uh, raced sled dogs and, and we hunted and fished and cross country skied and you know those kinds of things. Um, had a boat in Valdez, commercial fish for halibut. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, probably more fishing than hunting because yeah. we had a boat and it was easy to catch fish and we could barter we with traded. our, our yeah. friends and yeah. everybody seemed to have a moose and you know, <laughs> we didn't need to eat a whole moose or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. so we did that. But the sled dog racing was really. Um, it was serious. Something we, we both really enjoyed, and so we'd mm -hmm. train the dogs and travel around the state um, all winter long going to dog races. And then Kathy got involved with a group that was trying to get sled dog racing into the Olympics. It was the International Federation for Sled Dog Sports. So mm -hmm. we took our dogs to races in Winnipeg, World and in Austria, and Germany. Wow. And, uh, it was, how it was how large was your team of dogs? Well, we owned up to 40 and we raced up to 16. Wow. So it was, it was the That's un, very serious. Class. Yeah. What's the largest or the longest race that you guys did? Two 20s and a 30 at the Open North American here in town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 20 miles Friday, 20 miles Saturday, and 30, 28 miles on Sunday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We did sprint racing. We, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of training you had to do for the Iditarod just didn't fit our our lifestyle yeah, and schedule. Yeah. And Plus it's slow. <laughs> <laughs> no, well my, uh, I mean, not so much Lloyd's smart aleck answer, but mine is a lot of people, the Iditarod is a life testing adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we got paid to go camping at 40 below and I already knew I was tough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you didn't need to do the Iditarod to prove that to yourself yeah. and, mm -hmm. and sprint racing fit our lifestyle a lot better. We trained our dogs at lunch hour and, mm -hmm. and we'd bring them to work in the truck and yeah. go train at lunch and come back and it was actually a huge asset in village work mm -hmm. because when we first lived here they televised the Alaska Dog Munchers Association 
weekend races on rural TV. Statewide. Mm -hmm. Statewide. Mm -hmm. And Lloyd and I cleaned up and won all the races for two mm -hmm. or three years. Mm -hmm. And dog mushing is hugely respected in the villages. Mm -hmm. And so you get out to the villages and it was controversial times and people didn't really want them state messing and marine mammals. But, but here are these really good dog mushers. Mm -hmm. And so you come into town and you know, they want to have a meeting about return of marine mammal management to the state and they'd advertise it. You know, Kathy Frost dog mushers speaking mm -hmm. at the community hall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and even when I went to Kotzebue 10 years ago for my seal tagging project, that was my entree into hunting camp was mm -hmm. I went out and gave rabies shots to all the sled dogs and sat around and talked about training dogs and, mm -hmm. and then we talked about tagging seals. Mm -hmm. The traditional racing in Alaska wasn't long distance racing. Mm -hmm. There were short races that they had with the spring carnivals. Yeah. Every mm -hmm. the village would have their spring carnival and have a races that have a men's race and a women's race and things mm -hmm. like that. So, mm -hmm. so the Iditarod was something that was created, you know, honoring the serum run, but that wasn't a, a race that had money on it or anything. It was just to get the serum there. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, you know, it fit our lifestyles and we liked the dogs and mm -hmm. it was just a great thing to do. But it was sort of an unexpected compliment to, mm -hmm. to our work mm -hmm. because it, you, you needed to have the respect of the, the people you were interacting yeah. with and that was just an automatic mm -hmm. entree. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess transition a little more um, to your personal lives. Did you, well, I guess that was personalized, but everything's together when you're in wildlife biology. And when you work in the same office and are married to the same yeah. man and drive the same dog team. Um, I was going to ask, do you guys have any kids? No. Okay. So the dogs were, <laughs> were enough. I had, uh, I had Hodgkin's lymphoma when I was 30, early 30s, about mm. the time that we would have been thinking about kids and yeah. that precluded that option. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see, sorry, I got off track. <laughs> um, I guess what was, what projects, what were your first projects that you worked on, um, the Marine Mammals Project, what species well, study? When, when we got here to Fairbanks after we got done filling out our paperwork, Burns walked us into the back room and there were I think a dozen trash cans full of seal parts. In for said, We're a little behind here on our analysis of these specimens. And your jobs are to get through these specimens. Mm -hmm. So we spent pretty much all day, every day, in the, the lab, mm -hmm. uh, going through this, initially the seal stomachs and the reproductive tracts and then the, the jaws and all the, the kinds of things you had to do to get the natural history data for, mm -hmm. for these Poor species of ice seals, spotted mm -hmm. seals, ring seals, bearded seals, and ribbon seals. Mm -hmm. And um, not long after that, uh, the OXEP program kicked into gear and logistics became available to go out on yes. ships and collect seals or to go out on helicopters and, and survey seals or catch seal pups and put tags on them and things. So, mm -hmm. so it started out as, as entirely lab work and then it shifted into you know, quite a bit more field work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was just an incredible opportunity. I mean, at the time, I mean, we had no idea helicopters were $1,000 an hour. Mm -hmm. You'd go out on this NOAA ship and we had 100 hours of helicopter time. And I mean, you, you got up in the morning and you jumped in the helicopter and flew around and jumped, went diving out of the helicopter chasing seal pups and mm -hmm. catching them and mm -hmm. <coughs> doing science. And, we were collecting seals and doing otter trawls on board, and it was just a dream kind of a, of a thing. And we were so young and so new that in the beginning you really didn't realize how special it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and ended up working kind of chapters in our time that the offset funding provided the money from 78 to it was winding down. and. 86, 87, there were a few humps in there, but ice seal related work, all of it, and mm -hmm. it transitioned from seal diets to we use seal dogs to find ring seals in the ice and mm -hmm. look at winter ecology of ring seals and some aerial survey work and some beluga work. And then that money was fizzling and the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Yeah. 
came along. Yeah. And so we immediately ended up transitioning to Prince William Sound and doing mm -hmm. Harbor Seal projects mm -hmm. down there, satellite tagging and survey work. Mm -hmm. So you guys started a lot of your field work like fairly soon after the Marine Mammals Act, right? Mm -hmm. Did you see, did you do any work before it or did you no. see any, so did you know of any changes or was there just more funding after that? Um, well, the Marine Mammal Act was passed in 1972 mm -hmm. and prior to that the state of Alaska had management over, you know, all of the species that were used by the people in the state. Mm -hmm. Seals, sea lions, beluga whales, mm -hmm. uh, polar bears, sea otters, walrus. Um, and they were just like a caribou or a moose at mm -hmm. that point. Mm -hmm. And when we got here, the state was still engaged in the process to get management of marine mammals back from the federal government. Okay. And the act allowed a state to, to retake management if they met a certain set of stipulations. Mm -hmm. And the stipulations were written by lawyers and they were very difficult to accommodate. Yeah. And uh, so for a number of years, uh, we were, our boss John Burns mostly did it, but we were familiar with what he was doing, trying to, to go through these processes to, mm -hmm. to get state management back. In 1976, uh, the federal government gave Alaska back management for Pacific walruses. <clears throat> and so, they instituted a program which was, well, there were a lot, many ironies that went along with this state federal business with uh, marine mammals management, but uh, when the, the federal government had management, they didn't do much of anything in the way of monitoring hunts or sampling the animals or doing research, but when the state took it back, they were required to monitor the hunts and, you know, determine if the populations were being hunted sustainably and all of this kind of stuff. Very difficult to get the kinds of data that you needed. So after uh, two or three years of the state struggling on the, the walrus management part, they decided this is too crazy. We we just can't deal with all of the questions. I can remember one of the questions they asked one time was how many of the walruses that were struck and lost were male and how many were females. Do you know what struck and lost means? It means you never had your hands on it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so you know. Some of this just wasn't doable. Yeah. So they ended up basically violating it. There was no provision for the state give to give it back. It back. Mm -hmm. So they had to, you know, say, oh, we're canceling our programs. Oh, now you're violating the act. We're going to take it back. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, you know, everything just kind of came ground to a halt. And, but the state had never said that we're going to stop the effort. And so it was 1984, I guess. Uh, John Burns retired and I took over the program and there was a new director for wildlife, Lou Pamplin. And I told Lou, I said, Lou, we got to, you know, make up our mind on this so that if we aren't going to, to do anything on marine mammal management, then the federal government can start developing the programs. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, they had an excuse for not doing anything because the state was, you know, anticipating taking it back. So Kathy and I uh, <clears throat> came up with a strategy and we went around uh, the state and we said, okay, if you look at what's going on now and look at what realistically the state might be able to do, let's see about polar bears, walruses, and sea otters. See if the people in the state would be willing to see the state take over management of those sea otters because of the conflicts with shellfish, polar bears because, you know, there's interest in sport hunting them. Canada had a legal uh, program for hunting uh, polar bears in conjunction with the natives. and. In, you know, in Canada, that's where a lot of the money comes into the local villages. They buy the socks for their kids from sport hunting money. Uh, in Walrus, it's the same way. And so we went around to all of the coastal communities and held meetings and, you know, talked it over with, with the people. And, then, you know, there was some support and there was a lot of opposition because this was in the time when all of the Anilka and subsistence things were going on and the Marine Mammal Act did and still does give Alaska Natives an exclusive right to hunt the animals mm -hmm. and people distrusted the state. So, mm -hmm. so it wasn't a, a universal veto but it was a largely a veto of that. Yeah. Plus looking at the amount of money it would have taken to put in the monitoring programs and the research programs for those three species, it just didn't look like it was going to come to the state. It wasn't going to be worth that much to them in terms of you know revenues and all. So we recommended uh, to the commissioner that the state say we're not going to request for remainder management, mm -hmm. but 
we recommend that what you do is you go into co-management with the, the Alaska Natives. Mm -hmm. So this was sort of the first um, introduction of the idea of co-management for marine mammals. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's developed kind of haltingly, but it has developed, mm -hmm. and uh, so now the, the Alaska Natives have a pretty strong voice uh, on marine mammal management, and still have their uh, marine mammal act guaranteed right to hunt. Mm -hmm. But permitting was kind of, it, was, it, it had to change and be accepted mm -hmm. as the generations changed. Mm -hmm. Burns had operated in a world where there was no such thing as a marine mammal permit, and mm -hmm. so I mean, for really obvious things like going out and shooting something, Fish and Game requested a permit, but for collecting samples from dead hunter kills, mm -hmm. there's no way in heck John was going to ask permission to sample something that was already dead, mm -hmm. killed by a hunter. And mm -hmm. for aerial surveys that flew over, I mean, the whole way you picked your altitude for a survey is so you were high enough not to disturb something, and, mm -hmm. and John was not interested in requesting a permit for doing something that he considered non-problematic. And, and so that was the first generation. And then Lloyd and I came along and you know we had a little bit different definition because we'd come onto the scene at a later date. And then after we left, you know, so that permits have probably become, people request permission to do increasingly more things as time goes by. But it, but it is, and, and as we mentioned earlier, it's. I mean, we, I work a lot with hunters, and I mean, they can kill anything they want, right? Mm -hmm. And yet, when they become hunter biologists, all of a sudden you say, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And they say, what do you mean I can't do that? Mm -hmm. They say, you're not a hunter now, you're a scientist. When you're a scientist, you have to ask permission. <laughs> so how did you see the Marine Mammals Department Fish and Game change over your career? Well, it was all, we were always soft money. Mm -hmm. um, the state would have a little bit of general fund money that would pay the coordinators, mm -hmm. half of the coordinator's salary, but um, if we didn't have contract money, we didn't have anything to do. Mm -hmm. So the OXEP program was, was really crucial for that, and then the mineral, Minerals Management Service after that continued to, um, to support work that answered questions that they had, had to answer for um, uh, environmental impact statements and things like that. So mm -hmm. a lot of the work that uh, Kathy did especially in John too was uh, looking at the impacts of seismic activity on ring seals um, on fast ice because part of the exploration uh, modus operandi at that time was going out on the shore fast ice which is the preferred popping habitat for ring seals mm -hmm. with cat trains and plowing a, a path and then coming along behind it with with uh, big a loud booms. bunch of equipment and drilling holes in the ice and mm -hmm. you know making big booms, mm -hmm. and uh, you know of course the you don't see those ring seals because they're in layers and mm -hmm. you know you know so from a distance it looks like nothing's happening and so the question was you know how important is this so, so that was a, a topic of work for quite a while um, and then they started becoming interested in more areas like the Chukchi Sea and of course that involves species in addition to ring seals. So we did work in the Chukchi Sea with spotted seals, put the, the first satellite tags on spotted seals and, and learned, you know, how they used the marine areas. Were they going into lease areas? Were they not going into lease areas? Mm -hmm. um, we did a, a study in Kotzebue Sound that was uh, because they were talking about doing some oil gas leasing in the whole basin. And, um, you know, marine mammals, well, everything's hard to study. They're a little bit harder, though, because of the way they range over the open ocean. So mm -hmm. just a basic question, like, how important is Hannah Shoals out in the northern Chukchi Sea? Is that a particularly important place for bearded seals and walruses, or is it just like any other place? And, mm -hmm. and so uh, using the satellite tags and, and surveys, but uh, that became a, a way that uh, you could start determining, are there particularly important biological areas that maybe you want to put some stipulations on or even uh, leave out of, of these areas. And the other thing that happened, when we got to Alaska, there were no conservation issues. You know, the, the animals were being hunted, but the populations were all large. You know, people thought there were too many sea lions, mm -hmm. too many harbors, mm -hmm. 
definitely too many sea otters, you know, <laughs> and, and that was the way the issues were. And then sea lions collapsed, and then harbor seals started going down, and fur seals, which were never a state managed species, they went down. Uh, you know, so people started realizing, well, you know, maybe we're not looking carefully enough at, at the abundance and trends and what's going on. So you know, we worked on developing monitoring programs for, for some of these species, as, as well as evaluating whether or not they should be listed. And boy, when we left Fish and Game, darn near everything that we had worked on was either listed or being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act, which was pretty scary, really. Yeah. Yeah. But it, the, the pro, when during Lloyd and I, well, Burns, Burns was the start of the marine mammal program, and, mm -hmm. and when he was running the program, there was John and only John mm -hmm. for the whole everything north of the Aleutian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. And then there were a couple of people that worked out of the Anchorage office doing sea otters and sea lions. Lloyd and I came along and we tripled the size of the Fairbanks office, but, but throughout our tenure it was always a very small program. It was really Lloyd and I, and occasionally we had a technician and we had a biologist that helped us the last couple of years. And then now that Lori Quakenbush is running the program, they really have quite a, a large staff. She's got at least eight people, I think, down there working with her. And, but it, it was, people used to often tell Lloyd and I, oh, you guys are so lucky, you you have a job with a guaranteed salary. I was on soft money for 25 years, mm -hmm. and when, when Lloyd was the Marine Mammal Coordinator, they actually gave him part of his salary, but it, and it, it keeps you sharp. <laughs> and it's not always fun, but, mm -hmm. but it forces you to be collaborators and it forces you to publish mm -hmm. and those are some of the things that in, that agencies are criticized for mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. that is that people don't collaborate enough and people don't publish enough and if you're in the soft money arena mm -hmm. you you have to do both and, and that was a good thing mm -hmm. yeah there's quite a difference between the south of the Alaska range and north of the Alaska range and we initially did all of our work north of the Alaska Range and there was a, another group in the, the Anchorage area that did southeastern Alaska and Gulf of Alaska and Aleutian Island stuff, seal sea lions and sea otters. And they got a huge boost in funding when the sea lion collapse happened and you know, the question came up, is this due to the fisheries or not? And uh, so there were millions of dollars a year and their program grew and grew uh, very large because of that. And the oil spill happened and uh, at the time Harbor seals were had been documented to be declining in, in places like Dagetic and Kodiak because of some monitoring that a fellow named Ken Pitcher had started, and so the, some some money came along to do a harbor seal program, and then the oil spill uh, damage assessment and restoration fund. So mm. we were uh, kind of wondering where our next <laughs> money was going to come from about that time the oil spill happened. Though <laughs> offset, but it was winding down, and they really were at the very tail end of their funding and mm. you're kind of sitting there thinking, okay, what, you know, where, what direction are we going to go next and what are we going to work on? And so we were in Valdez three days after the tanker hit the rocks and we were there for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Not quite constantly, but, mm. but for the next 10 years we were doing Harbor Sea work in Prince William Sound. And it was really good and the, the amount of uh, resource that was available was enough to do a good comprehensive long-term study. Mm. And, uh, that kind of study hadn't been done before in Alaska and harbor seals. Mm -hmm. Harbor seals are a very popular species to study in, along both coasts because you can take a graduate student and a pair of binoculars and a car and go drive and count seals, for example. Mm -hmm. A little harder in Alaska. They're all over the place and a lot of those places are, are a ways offshore. Kathy, what was your favorite project that you worked on? It might be hard to choose, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably we had a project to use trained Labradors to find seals oh, in um, snow caves uh -huh. up in the Cotsview Sound, Cape Lisburn area mm -hmm. that we did for three different years. And, and I really liked that project. Yeah. And we'd go out and camp on the ice eight or ten miles offshore in a lot of cases and base out there for a month or six weeks. and 
you know, you'd wake up and work the dogs all day, every day, run them in front of snow machines, and they go, and it was pre GPS, and mm -hmm. so the dogs would go out and find a, a snow cave or a breathing hole and dig and show you where it was, and then we'd laboriously take our compasses, our <laughs> handheld compasses, and we'd pace to the hole. And, you know, it was 322 paces through the snow at such and such an angle. And mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to find somebody that we're going to try to get a grant to retrieve, rescue that data yeah. and, and try to and get calculate it published the and points. figure out where the points were oh, wow. and <laughs> do something that could, we could do a comparative study now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that, I, I, mean, I like a lot of the projects, but I really like that mm -hmm. one. What was your favorite? Well, I mean, a lot of them are very rewarding and, and fun. And it's, uh, I almost hate to say that I enjoyed the oil spill studies because <laughs> it was yeah. it was a big tragedy for the state of Alaska. But uh, but the seal catching that was done there was was really good. We had a good crew mm -hmm. of people and uh, liked that a lot. But I think the most rewarding thing that I've been involved in, and Kathy too, is the co-management of Belugas. Mm -hmm. um, it's just brought together a group of people that have you know, been continuously working on this for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a situation where there's not a crisis now, mm -hmm. but you know, you look at what's happened in other places uh, and the option is there. But we've worked with some really fine uh, Alaska Native people and uh, they've helped us hugely to learn things about Belugas. I mean, if it hadn't been for the involvement of the Blue Committee, we wouldn't know what the populations were, or how big they are, or whatever. Yeah. And the federal government recognized that, that we're, we, the Blue Committee, is well positioned to do this and has given some consistent funding, not a huge amount of funding, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. which pays for meetings, but also for research. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's just as rewarding as can be seeing these, mm -hmm. these guys, how interested in it they are, how willing they are to to collaborate how they know uh, they're the ones that are saying hey we got to know how many animals are here so we can deal with this resource properly so we'll have blueberries here for our children mm -hmm. so you know um, if that's uh, our legacy I think that alone would be a good one yeah. and I you know I had a satellite tagging project in Kotzebue Sound from 2003 to 2009 mm -hmm. that that was huge too. It was after I retired and I was teaching local hunters to be biologists and to, to catch and tag seals and, and to watch that project go from the first year when you know I was a scientist and and they were the guys that had the boats and the nets to the final year when I mean I could literally stay at home and you know they caught the seals and tagged the seals and process the seals and and were so empowered by it and it was their science and and their project and those maps mm -hmm. it, it's like the beluga project I mean there, there's personal ownership and to to realize that you've helped people get involved and make a difference in, in their own lives by involving them in that kind of mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. and I mean that's the thing I like to be able to continue to do it. So, whether it's the Blue Committee or, or, or SEAL guys that helping to, to work to bring those two worlds together. Because mm -hmm. they can get pretty feeling pretty far apart. Yeah. What advice do you guys have for any um, aspiring wildlife professionals in this day and age? Um, probably a very open-ended question. But <laughs> well, I, I'll repeat what I said a little bit earlier this mm -hmm. afternoon. Cooperate, cooperate. Co it's, it's really important to collaborate with other people, to collaborate across disciplines, just because it broadens your worldview and it helps you look at a question from much many more points of view. It makes you a better scientist. Mm -hmm. To collaborate, collaborate across organizations and and agencies, it it makes you a better member member of the science family. But again, it I think probably all humans do this. But in, in science, we tend to identify. Well, I'm a moose biologist, and I work for the state, or I work for the Fed. The public perceives us all 
as scientists. And the sooner we realize that and learn to work together with presenting a, a positive unified front, the better off we're going to be because other people don't make those little tiny distinctions that, that we make. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think that would be, you know, learn to, learn to collaborate and communicate sooner rather than later. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think young scientists today have, have a huge opportunity because the, the tools that have been developed over time. Uh, we didn't have telemetry when we started mm -hmm. out. We didn't have GPS. We didn't have remote sensing. We didn't have ocean buoys out there giving streams of continuous data about the conditions in the ocean. All of those things are, are, are available now. And so if you ask good questions and you take advantage of the tools and you look at it in a multidisciplinary way, you can really start answering important questions. It's always been fairly easy to answer the, the what, where, or why questions. You can fly around and see animals or you can you know, get in the boat or whatever else. The why questions, you know, why are the animals using this area? Why is the population going up and down? You're stumped almost all the time. And so getting to the why questions, I think. And I think with these tools now, if you do as Kathy said, collaborate and you know, get the people who can integrate these big data streams and that can figure out the sensor that you need to determine, you know, what the sound level is at the location where the whale is diving which you can do now, you know, you can start saying, okay, now it's affected by that sound because you have an accelerometer on it and it does backflips when you, it hears this particular sound. Mm -hmm. Those questions are approachable. They weren't approachable 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and it's gonna get nothing but better. There's a lot of clever people working on this. One of the big challenges is managing those big streams of data. Mm -hmm. Just the sheer mass of information that's coming in from oceanic buoys and from remote sensing now, if, if the data storage wasn't getting so much better, you'd be filling rooms, you'd be filling buildings with this data. So that's going to be a big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, find a place where you can contribute to that, that big picture, look at things, ask good questions, figure out the ways. If you don't have the sense you need, you can probably find someone that will make it for you if you make a good case of support. But you've got to keep connected to the animals you're studying. You can't only sit in front of a computer. I mean, the, the older you get as a scientist, I mean, right now, any grad student can handle a computer way better than I can and do a lot more sophisticated math. But you realize through time, the questions people really want an answer to are observations you made of how animals live in the world. And that's not all of what you want your your worldview to be, but you'd need to, somewhere along the line, really touch bases with the animal you're studying and, and know what a ring seal looks like when it swims through the water, mm -hmm. so that when you're looking at dive data and trying to interpret something, you've got a picture in your head of what this animal does in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, over and over, we you'll run into somebody who will make a comment about a data set and you say, you've obviously never seen the animal, have you? you, you well, the big advantage you have in Alaska is that the people are closely tied to the animals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the local folks can bring you up straight if you're way off track. Say, mm -hmm. no, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. They don't do that, you know? <laughs> and, and you should listen to them and figure out where it is you went wrong, or maybe they're not right either. But, you know, you, you have a, a check because animals are important to people. They're going to stay important to people. They're careful watchers. They care. So, you know, Working with the local people, that is always going to be helpful to you. So yeah, Kathy, what were your experiences as a field biologist, a field technician, being a woman, um, especially when you're not working with very many other women early on in your career? Really big changes in the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. and when I was your age doing this, there were very, very few women working in the field. Mm -hmm. And certainly in Alaska, I think that was even more exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Fish and Game had one other gal biologist and she basically didn't go in the field. Mm -hmm. And 
I was lucky to have a couple of field partners, Lloyd one of them, and my buddy Bob Nelson, who really didn't care if I was a girl or a guy, they just cared that I could do my job. Mm. And I think both of those guys helped me realize too, you know, it's really easy to think you have to, everybody has to do everything that everyone else does, and nobody is the same. People, people are equal, but they're not the same. And the quicker you realize that you have your set of skills and someone else has their set of skills. And I mean, I was never gonna be able to pick up something as heavy as Lloyd or Bob could, but my hands were small. Mm -hmm. And they fit in places their hands didn't. And if you had to fix something or, or do something, I could do it different. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, you know, Lloyd's a stickler for being competent and he insisted that if I was going to be in small boats and working around nets and equipment that I not only do it but I do it well and I do it right mm -hmm. and that was huge mm -hmm. and so I guess that was something that I tried to to pass on to, to other young women as I went along is that it, it's important to be good it's not, you can't just go out and say, well, I want, I want, I want, I want to be equal, I want to be the same, and then turn around and say, well, I can't, I don't know how, I don't want to. You, you, you can't have your cake and eat it, too. You, you've got to, and, and in the early days, you were, you know, I was out there as me, but I was out there, a lot of guys were looking and saying, well, I don't want women in the field, and I don't want a girl around, and, and so you weren't just acting for yourself. You were paving the way for people that would come up behind you, and there was some responsibility to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do well and, and, mm -hmm. and be good so that the gals that came behind you would have an easier way to go. And, and I think now, I, mean, I look around me and you go to a marine mammal conference and 60 or 70 percent of the people in the room are, are gals now. Mm -hmm. there's, there's been a huge change, but, but guy or gal, it's, it's, in, it's important to be good at what you do, and to figure out what you're good at, mm -hmm. and and then you know specialize in something. And you know, if you want to go in the field and run small boats, then take the time to learn how to do that. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the differences when I grew up is you know, boys pulled apart car engines and repaired boats, and most girls didn't. And if you're going to be a field biologist in the Arctic, you, you got to be able to do something. And, I wasn't near as good at engines as Lloyd and Bob were, but I learned how to replace water pumps and outboard engines. And we went through a lot of water pumps when we worked in Bristol Bay and silty water. And so you could make a contribution. You're not just a, a hanger on. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions you want to hit on? Or? Climate change, maybe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's another yes. <laughs> Change. What? <laughs> it's changed. What do you think uh, the future holds? Well, obviously, there's been a, a lot of work on trying to anticipate how marine mammals will respond to climate change. And they're, they're charismatic megafauna for better or for worse. Uh, and people do care. And, and again, in Alaska, because they are used by people, it, it has some. Um, Deeper importance than just whether you you know your whale watching industry isn't making as much money, mm -hmm. um, and like all serious scientific questions, it's complicated, mm -hmm. and it's not the same for all species, and it goes into areas that uh, we're not that good at really. I, I said earlier you don't understand the whys very well even now. So you say, okay, we're going to change circumstances from here to there. A lot of why questions involved. Um, so for the ice associated species, everybody says, well, they like ice, so you can have less ice, so things are going to get worse. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case with bowhead whales. Bowhead whales are increasing and seem to be doing just fine with less ice, but still, they live their whole life in or close to ice. Um, What's going on there? We don't really know. Polar bears, you'd think that one would be kind of simple because they hunt off of, off of ice with some exceptions. Mm -hmm. Hudson Bay, they spend a lot of time on shore. Mm -hmm. That area has been very well researched and 
it turns out that, yep, they can be flying on shore up to a point. They have to have a certain number of days on the ice hunting seals in order to get fat enough that they can live on shore. So that's, that tells you that the Hudson Bay polar bear population is probably going to have a problem. But you know, what's the limit of adaptability of these species? Um, ring seals, you know, again, you would think they're going to have a real problem because all ring seals that we know of have their pups and layers on the ice. If you look at something else like uh, spotted seals, some spotted seals pop on land, some spotted seals pop on the ice, most of them on the ice. What's going to happen with them? We don't necessarily know. So a lot of the, the things that are going to affect the populations may well be through trophic systems, you know, the prey. Is the prey going to go away? Is it going to be replaced by something of less value that's moved in from the south or something that they just don't know how to catch or deal with? You know, you would think over uh, longer periods of time, most species would adapt to those sorts of things. But the changes are a lot faster than the normal uh, adaptation ability. So it's, you know, it's going to be winners and losers. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the losers, losers are almost certainly are going to be the strongly ice adapted species. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like belugas really make you question it because the belugas in Bristol Bay are doing just fine. And, you know, they're out of the ice most of the time. And the ice comes down and they go out into the ice, though. What's the importance of that? Well, you know, it's harder for killer whales to get out on the ice. Maybe, but, you know, maybe it's just a habit that they have that they've never lost. You know, it, whereas other belugas, they'll, they'll spend a lot of time in 90% ice cover. And you think, why do you want to be 90% ice cover? It's going to be a little hard to, you know, to get around. But there's some, some reason for them to be there that we just don't know. And uh, nobody's up there at 80 degrees north, and you know, water that's 4,000 meters deep, and you can't imagine there's any reason an animal should be there when they go there. So you know. But when you're sitting here in 40 years from now, having an interview like this, you're going to have a whole new perspective on climate change. I mean, it's like. I mean, it's, it's horrifying to stand here and think how long that you've really, 40 years is a really long time. You can't imagine that you've been doing something that long, but the changes that, that we've seen and, and in your lifetime, you'll, you'll see yeah. huge changes, but you, you don't really know what they're going to be. But I, I'm a believer that animals are more resilient than we think they are. But that said, there, there comes a point when the tipping points are real, and and it's frightening because we don't know where they where they are and where they're going to be. I mean, animals wouldn't have persisted through time and be where we are now if they couldn't tolerate change. But, but. the importance of long-term data sets you can't overestimate that. I mean, the, the reason we understand what happens in Hudson Bay is because Ian Sterling's been studying the the bears there rigorously for. 40 years, and during that period of time, the environment changed. I suppose if you had a long-term monitoring study for 40 years and the environment didn't change at all, that wouldn't be terribly informative. But you know, right now, you can be pretty much guaranteed that in Alaska, the characters, it's the environment going to change. And you have now remote sensing, you have buoy data, you're going to have very, very fine resolution data on the environment. So I think the opportunity is there to, to get a fair bit of, uh, of information. The, when they evaluated all of the ice seals for uh, Endangered Species Act listing, they didn't list spotted seals or, or ribbon seals, which a lot of people wondered, well, how can that be? And one of the conclusions in the report, or statements in the report, um, that I thought was kind of interesting, they said, well, in Alaska, it's still going to be cold and dark in the winter. <laughs> and it is going to be cold and dark enough that ice is going to form in the Bering Sea and be there long enough that the seals will be able to have their pups. And this is over a 50-year horizon or something. It doesn't say that it will still be like that in 100 years. But, you know, people have some pretty good information to make projections, but there's going to be a lot of surprises. You know, you might wake up one day and, oh, you have hit a tipping point and, you know, nobody's seen the spotted seals anymore or something. And the other thing is, it's not just going to be losses. You're going to get gains. You're yeah. going to get king crab moving north, mm -hmm. and halibut moving north, and spotted seals moving Salmon north. Salmon are moving north. Yeah, you know, 
tom cards? Um, it sort of, in terms of an ecological experiment, it's going to be fascinating. Yeah. You know, I mean, can little stellar sea lions be hauling out of the beach of Barrow one of these days? I don't think so, but maybe, you know. Remembering to capture it as you go through it. I mean, I think that we all, when we live in the middle of a time, you think, that. Eh, I mean, it's, it's, it just is, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't particularly think about the need to keep records or keep track of what's happening right now and you don't know, realize that 20 years from now this is a long time ago and it's valuable. Yeah. I mean that's kind of I think true with Lloyd and I in 1975. You don't think about collecting baseline information for a world that's going to be drastically different in your lifetime than in the time when you're still doing science. Figuring out a way to not have all those fish and game archives in the basement disappear, that, that it's actually worth trying to figure, right, figure out a way to preserve some of that information. So even if it's not in today's format and quite as precise or sophisticated, that it, it still is a record of, mm -hmm. of what happened back then. Any final words before we end the interview? You know, it's a, for us, it was a wonderful opportunity to do science in Alaska, and it's going to be for anybody for the foreseeable future. And uh, yeah, you know, there are ups and downs, there are funding crises and things like that. The opportunities are still there. It, it's not like that in so many other places. We, we could always say, somebody say, oh, I want to do the study. And you might have thought about doing that study. You say, that's great, you do that. I got a list of 40 other things that I could do, you know, so it's not like, well, humpback whales in Hawaii are an example, living in Hawaii now. It is a crowded field, know. you know, and if you want to break into the humpback whale field, you probably won't be able to do it. it, it the territories are laid out, and, you know, this guy gets to do the acoustics in this particular place, and this guy gets to do the photographs in another place. It's, it, it's not like that here, you know, the opportunities are wide open, and the questions are are many and not going to all be answered in the next hundred years. Questions aren't going to go away anytime yeah. soon. <laughs> no. Well, thank you guys so much for participating yeah. in the interview. Okay, yeah. <laughs> We're done. <laughs>